so I've titled today's message, My Source of Understanding. And so what is John doing? Well, John is, is in the middle of, of taking us through, um, uh, you know, he, he, he wrote to the churches there that Paul had planted. These churches had been around for some time, you know, a number of, of decades they've been around. And, and as he's, he's writing to them, we're, we're in this phase of this epistle, this letter, where, where he's going through that third discussion about what it looks like to be a child of God. He's giving them some, some basic understanding. This was for the Christian. This is for the Christian in a fellowship that, hey, you should understand this about God. And what he does is that he, he uses the Holy Spirit as the baseline. Take a look, 1 John chapter 3. This is the very last verse before you move into chapter 4. It says, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So John is using the Holy Spirit as the baseline. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he wrote even a little bit more pointedly in the book of Romans, Romans chapter eight. Take a look at the screen here for this one. Uh, Paul says this in Romans. He says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then he continues on to, to magnify and so you and I, we should understand that it is the Holy Spirit that is working in us. It is the Holy Spirit that is, is producing and bringing forth the fruit in our life. Uh, it is not us trying to be better Christians. And when we look back into that time when John uh, wrote, it back there into, into the first century here, uh, the Jews, they didn't wrestle with the, the deity of the coming of the Christ because they knew Messiah would come. You know, they had the Old Testament prophecies there, but they did wrestle with the humanity of Christ and they rejected Jesus. They said, there's no way this, this, this guy, this Jesus, he's not God. He's not the Messiah that we're looking for. He's not the one. This is an imposter. And yet the Bible tells us, again, one more time on the screen, Colossians chapter two and nine. The Bible tells us for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. We understand that, 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 that Jesus is 100% God and he's a, he was 100% man as well. And, and, and this is what some have wrestled with in the past. This is what people are wrestling with here right now, I guess, in our, in our present world. Because when we get into 2024, listen, understanding uh, uh, you know, the, what a genuine faith is, is still an issue in our communities, in our churches because there are many people that come into churches and, 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 and maybe there's some in this room or maybe there's some watching online right now, but let me be more pointed, this room right here, you, okay? Maybe there's some in here right now that, that you know, that, that all of your life you've heard about Jesus and all of your life you've, you've consented or, you, you know, you've made that, um, you know, you've made that point of your heart to acknowledge the historical fact of Jesus but you deny the deity of Christ because you don't allow Christ to be the Lord of your life. And what John is, is doing here, John is arming the church. He's giving the church a basic understanding about faith. He's showing us how to know, how to detect what's of God and what's not of God. And that, that becomes important to us, guys. And then, and, 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 if I could skip all the way to the end of the conclusion of what he's bringing, you and I could understand that Jesus says that we must be born again in John chapter three. That would be the, the conclusion of the entire message. And, 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 and I think just, just by looking at this room, just by looking at your faces, I, I see you, I know many of you, not all of you, but many of you would just say, yeah, amen, I know that. I went to church a long time ago, I got that. But we fall into this thing of completely not recognizing and not paying attention to, to what Jesus has spoken about being born again and, and really what it entails. It's the same wrestle that they were going with back in first century Christianity, you know, about Jesus, God, man, it's crazy. I don't know how that you know, I, I don't know how it is that we in our finite mind can, can you know, um, kind of come to that solid conclusion regarding the Trinity, and yet it's, it's taught within the Scriptures. 
you know, an infinite God and our little finite minds trying to, to, to look upon these things and understand these things, it's like, I don't understand how God does what he does. But the simple things that we can understand within God's word, the simple things that, that, that we can apprehend from the scripture, these become our source for understanding. It is his word. It's the light of his word. There's two things I want us to capture here today. Number one is this, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Uh, verses number one and two again, John says, he says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and then he continues on. He tells us how we know what a, what a profession is. Now, as we start looking at this, there's a key right out of the gate. He's telling us, second line, he says, he says don't believe, do not believe. Beloved, do not believe. And, and in the original Greek, the idea here is stop believing, Stop believing all the nonsense that you hear out there. That's, that's, the, that's the original um, flavor, if you will, behind the Greek structure of the words. And he moves them into this place of saying, stop believing just everything that you hear and move into this place and, and, and to test it. He uses a crazy word. It seems like every time I, I say a Greek word, I have a, a Hispanic accent that is attached to it. So I don't know how that works out. Maybe it's my culture, my heritage. I'm not sure what happens, but I'll try to give you the Greek word here. But if it sounds like I'm, I have a little bit of Hispanic in me, I think I do. So there you go. So here's the word. It's test. It's, it's dokimazo is something to that effect. Dokimazo. It's something that you guys have heard before. If you've been around the church, it means to examine. It means to scrutinize. Uh, the, the word describes the testing of metals. Stick with me. The testing of metals. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. I've heard that, right? You know, it, listen, is this thing gold? Is this thing silver? Is this, is this something else? What is this? Dake mazo. And what John is saying, he says, stop believing. Do not believe every spirit. Stop believing every other thing that you're hearing out there. And, 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 and take this test. Examine it. Scrutinize it. Administer this. For those people that are claiming a faith in Christ, are they for real or is, are they just somebody that is self-deceived? Is this, is this a genuine Christian Christianity or is this some sort of a, a fake Christianity? Is it authentic or is it a knockoff? Yeah, I know a lot of people get excited about knockoffs, right? I mean, you go visit somewhere and you come back, it's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm sporting. Um, I remember when I was in, in real estate, you know, years and years and years ago, somebody sold me a, a, a knockoff Rolex watch. It's just a true story. You know, they, they gave it to me for like, I don't know, it was like 500 bucks or so, you know, and it's like a, you know, a couple thousand, maybe $3,000 watch, something, something like that, whatever I had. A, 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 and if I'm recalling the name right, I think it was a Submariner is what it was called. So whatever those things cost. And I had this watch. I thought I was cool. You know, I was, I was in my, gracious, I think it must have been late 20s, maybe, maybe 30 years old or so. And I'm, you know, I'm sporting around in the office. Of course, I'm the new guy in the office. I got a, I got a Rolex on. Yeah, it was that funny because it was the biggest piece of junk I ever bought. <laughs> Stupid, you know, the screw would fall out of it. The band would come off. And no matter what you do, I got straight up ripped off. But do you want to be ripped off in your Christianity? No, then we have to, dake mazo, we have to test, we have to examine, we have to scrutinize the things that we hear. And it don't matter if you're hearing this in your, in your home, in your workplace, in your, your personal Bible study, or this church, if you're hearing it in this church, or another church, wherever you find yourself, you have to examine these things to see if these things are true. You, you have to dive in to see. Listen, uh, you know, are, are the spiritual leaders that are pouring into my life, are they telling me the truth? Are they rightly dividing this word so that I'm able to come up with an accurate understanding of who God is and what God has done for me? Dake mazo. And we are not to be fooled. Now, I, I, I want to share with you some very practical things here before we come and, and we really kind of unpackage some of this thing. So I want you to follow with me to your right. Go to your right. Uh, book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. In fact, I'm going to use the NLT on this. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. Now, those of you that are familiar with the book of Revelation, you'll know that chapter 2 and chapter 3 is Jesus speaking to the seven different churches of Revelation. And as he speaks to them, we come to the very last church, the seventh church, uh, down in verse number 14. It's the church of Laodicea. And here's what he says. 
He says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Stop, pause, and take a look at me for just a second. For simple understanding as we move through this, get this, understand this. At the end of chapter one, he is describing all of the pieces and parts, whether we're coming from lamps and lampstands and, and angels and all of this stuff. He, there's an understanding that is in there that he lays out. And when he, he puts this in here, we're not speaking of an angelic being. We have an, um, we have a, an English word there, angel, uh, but the word is messenger in, in the original language. And the idea is, is that God is speaking to the leaders of the churches, the pastors of the churches. Why the pastors of the church? Because the pastor of the church is responsible for leading the church, for teaching the church, for equipping the saints of a work of ministry, right? This is what the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians. And he, and, and he says here, opening this up, Jesus is speaking. Uh, he says, write this letter to the angel, to the pastors of the church in Laodicea. And he goes on, he says, this is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. Who is that? It's Jesus. Now here's what Jesus says, verse number 15. He says, I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. And then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will, you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and, and, and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Father, send your Spirit, bless your word, and bring us understanding here this morning how we apply your truth to our life in this moment. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said. All right, there are some things that we should understand. We should understand that, that, uh, that our source of understanding comes from the Lord. And as we get here and as we look at, at just some examples here, we, we, we're, we're, we're looking that, that we're, we're seeing rather that Jesus is looking into this church, the church that is, 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 is like represents the last, um, you know, the last day's church. And, and we can clearly see that. And if we pour the background information into this, suddenly this thing just, it, it just opens up in news ways. Because Laodicea was in a tri-city area. And, 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 and if you can receive this, if you could just, just imagine that you're unfolding a map, you're looking at a map, maybe it's a Bible map. Maybe you already have a map in the back of your Bible. And, and, and you open up and, and you're going, okay, this is Laodicea. They, where's that? Oh, it's over here. Okay, cool. Well, Hierapolis sit right up above it. And Hierapolis was right there, and then there was a river that came down and all this stuff. And, and Hierapolis, it, it was a place that had hot springs. So they were known for hot water. Laodicea was a little bit farther downstream, if you will, from them. And, and they had lukewarm water there. And then going on below that, Colossae was there. And Colossae was a place, hey, it was known for ice cold water. So as Jesus is speaking to the church in Laodicea, this region representing the last days, Jesus was using their water system as that, 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 that illustration, if you will, to describe the spiritual temperature of their hearts. In that church, in that community, in that area, here's what was going on. That, that their temperature, these people had been rocked to sleep from three different things. Remember, according to 1 John 5 and 19, what we'll see here in a week or so is that, that the enemy of your soul and mine wants to come in and put the world to sleep, rock people to sleep. The, 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 you know, John says the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. And the idea, again, is, is, is that he's rocking us to sleep from, from addressing, looking, being sensitive to, and dealing with spiritual matters. This lukewarmness of this, this church, Laodicea, it happened for three reasons. They'll flash them on the screen here for you. 
The first reason that it happened is because that in this region, they had the strongest banking system that was there. It was, it was a powerful banking system. And what did that mean to people in that area? It meant nothing more than they had money. Very easy to see that. Second thing about this particular church in this area is, is that, that history tells us that they had a medical school there that produced eye medicine. What do we understand about that? Well, we, we, we understand that what Jesus said, he says, hey, listen, he says, buy from me ointment so you can see clearly. But, but maybe we would just recognize that they had money and they had some type of a healthcare system there. Third thing that we should understand is that they had a, a booming clothing market. And you'll remember when I read to you, Jesus is saying, hey, come and buy from me these white garments. What they sold was black wool. It was, it was, it was their deal. And, and, and so they had money, they had a healthcare system, and maybe we would say that they, they had like outlet malls, if you will, for clothing and all that. Very simple to understand. But as we look at that, we can think to our particular time. They were educated, they were healthy, they were wealthy, but most of them were spiritually deceived. And we can relate to these things right here. And when everything is going well within our life and all of our needs are met, watch, stick with me on this. Who needs God? Who needs God? Everything is good. I don't need God. And that's part of the, the spiritual deception. The Laodiceans had a high level of confidence in what they had attained and what they've done and their hope for their future and their hope for their area and all of these things. And what it did is it put them asleep spiritually. It moved them into this place. And we can get that, gang. We can get that in 2024. You know, just speaking to this room, not, not, not in, a, not in a, a, a condescending way, not in a lecturing tone of, of like, uh, you know, like not, not that kind of tone, but in, but in a real tone. We get this. We understand how crafty the enemy of our soul is and how weak our humanity is and how quickly we get turned off from God. Why did you come to church this morning? Well, you know, why do you find yourself here sitting in this room? I don't know if it's because of pain. I don't know if it's because of problems. I don't know if it's because of, of, of somebody else praying for you. I don't know if it's because you're responding to the conviction of, of God's Holy Spirit. I don't know if it's because, you know, you, you've tried to do life in such a way. And it's like, well, it's a new year and I got kids and I need to make sure we're doing these things. I don't know why you're here today. I don't know. Some of you I've seen your faces, you know, week in, week out. Some of you I've seen you for years. But all of us can understand the problem that was going on in the church of Laodicea. But these folks, they knew enough to be saved, but they did very, very, very little of living out their faith. They were lukewarm. And if we use the epistles of God, we use, okay, let me use the, let me use the words. Uh, we have an Old Testament, we have a New Testament. Okay, in the New Testament, we have the Gospels, uh, and then we have the book of Acts, we have epistles, and then we have the book of Revelation. The epistles, the, 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 you know, the, the vast majority of the New Testament, the epistles, these letters, it's all about Christian living. For those of you that are just coming in, that's new to you. For those of you that have been here, you understand that. But here's what I want to point out to you about that. Take a look at the screen. James chapter 2, verse 24, James tells us this. He says, so you see... We are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. I'm only taking one verse and a whole string of things. And that whole string of things is James was communicating to the people that were losing their way yet again that, hey, you say you have a faith. Let your life demonstrate that, in fact, that you are saved. That's what he's saying. The people in Laodicea, the church in Laodicea were in that place to where their faith had been diminished and or even extinguished for some because they were rocked to sleep with their money and, and, and the comforts that they had in this life and the benefits that they had. They were in this place. And as we circle all the way back around to our text here in 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1, John is saying, he says, do not believe every spirit. He says, stop believing that anything goes he says, but test, test what's going on. Why? Because there are many religious imposters out there. There's false spirits, there's false prophets. And we should test what we're believing. We should test what we're living out. We, we are to look into the perfect law of liberty, as, as uh, Paul says, right, to see if these things are, are, are true. In the book of Acts, many of you have heard that we're to be like the Bereans, that we're to open up the scriptures and to see if these things are true. 
while a pastor is held responsible for the things that he teaches, if I water the word down uh, uh, you know, so much in your life that there's no conviction, there's no, you, know, you're, you're, you don't sense the power of God working in you, then I'm the one that's out of line. But if you don't open up the word of God for yourself and to see if the things in which you're being taught are true and what you're going to do with those things, then you're held accountable for that. So each of us has a part to play here in this. And what John is encouraging the church, he's the, he's the apostle of love. He's the aged apostle. He's the last living guy. He's somewhere 90, 95 years old. They have to carry him around to bring him in. And what he's telling them is, is, is that don't forget these simple things. Don't forget how basic Christianity is. Don't forget what Jesus has called you to. Don't forget that you're a new creation in Christ. Don't forget that it's only by being born again that you're actually saved. And why that sounds basic and, 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 and okay to, to, to many, the reality of it was, of what was what was happening with them. Take a look at verse number two. He says, by this you know the spirit of God. And then there's a colon there, and he says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And he moves forward with some other stuff here. But in his day, it was absolutely essential that the believers of that time could stand against the Gnosticism. You know, all of these heretical teachings that were coming in. And what was happening is, is that people were stumbling from an ignorance of God's word, no different than what happens today. People stumble from an ignorance of God's word. Listen, God's word tells us, the Lord tells us himself that his word is alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, but it has a reason behind that. By a show of hands in this room, be honest with me too, has anybody had a surgery on your body or you known somebody that's had a surgery? That really, if we're here, it should be pretty much everybody. We know somebody that's had surgery. How do they open up a body? Cut it. Cut it. Thank you, Doug, for playing a part on this. This one required a lot of... Yeah, that one required a lot. Good job. Thank you. Uh, would anybody disagree with what he said? How do you open up a body? Cut it open. Okay, cut it open. We're, you know, we're about 50%. We'll take it. Hmm. Why? So that you can do the body harm. So you can leave a gnarly, nasty scar. That's it. That's why. Yep, that's why we go. Yeah, some doctors jack it up and it gets really ugly looking scars there. Hmm, that's true. But the intent behind a surgery is to get something that's toxic out of the body or to repair the body or something like that. Listen, God's word is alive. He compares it to a sword, right? And when that sword goes in, what happens? It, it, it separates, watch, stick with me and understand this. It separates the temporal from the eternal. And many times that conviction comes in such a way, it's like, oh man, that one hurt. Oh, that one hurt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fine. In the moment, it, 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 it might, you might feel a little sensation of pain. It's no different than you going to the dentist. Maybe the dentist didn't get all the Novocaine in your, in, your, in your jaw there, and all of a sudden he gets a little thing, he's doing a root canal, and you go, oh, like that. Oh, well, we've got to numb that up a little bit more. You know, it's, it, 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 it's not that the procedure that he's going through is wrong. The procedure of a root canal or a, or a body surgery is, is to help the body get to a place that is back to health. When God's word goes forward in such a way and it comes forward and, and, and it's almost like it's, it's just like it's so narrow. Oh, yeah, that's what Jesus said, by the way. Okay, and, and, and it does come right in and it pierces right to those issues. God uses his word through the empowering of his Holy Spirit, the presence of his Holy Spirit to open our hearts up so that we can receive what he's saying that we might not be deceived. Because who wants to deceive us? Satan wants to, de wants to deceive us. And, and, and what about Satan's ministers? What, is, what does the Bible say about his ministers? That they appear as angels of light. That's why I'm glad I have an ugly face. <laughs> they appear as angels of light, right? Okay, you know, they, uh, they look so polished, so put together, so all of these particular things. And, and, and what we're called to do, you and I, John says, test it. Don't believe all of these things. Test it. You have the word of God. Test it. Does it stack up to what he says? And at that time, the ignorance of God's word was so pervasive that, 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 that what happened is, is they started dividing in these different camps and doing these different things. One of the things, perhaps you've heard of this crazy term, is called asceticism. It, it, it's nothing more than the people, would, they would separate themselves. They would isolate themselves. They would move to this place of even treating their body with these harsh treatments. You know, they, would, they, they shunned the material world. They avoided all pleasures and, and, and they, they, they limited their interactions with other people. 
That was something that was very popular back then. But you know, it still happens today within the church because you get some Christians that, man, they, they, they like to go to these extreme links thinking that they're adding to their holiness. When in reality, they're pulling back is just, they're just diminishing the mission that God has, has placed and given to each one of us to be out in, in, in a lost world. Jesus told us very plainly in the Gospel of John, he says, he says, listen, you're in the world, you're not of the world. I'm going to pray for you, that the Father would keep you. And, 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 and many Christians move into this place where we get into this, this place of, of being so separated. There's no impact that's happening within our life. We're living in these cocoon capacities. They're doing that. And on the other side, they had, they had folks that were going down this vein of what is called Epicurean. And this group, these considered, these, these folks, they said, hey, listen, is pleasure over truth. And the primary pursuit of our life is absolutely pleasure, whatever I can do. And I would suggest to you that both of these thoughts, maybe, maybe we don't use those terminologies anymore. Maybe, uh, maybe those, technically those phrases are there, but we've gotten away from using those words. The words that we use today, liberal and conservative. And when you follow either one of those, guess what? Neither one of those positions is going to get you into heaven. I don't care what your political stance is here today. I care whether you're following Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, the whole entire issue that we're looking at here, the key to this whole thing is the lordship of Jesus. Don't just believe when somebody says, or maybe you don't even believe it within your life. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, this is surely a personal test, but he also shared that this is much more than a personal test because he said, don't, don't, don't believe everything that you're hearing. And I think that when we go into this next phase here, some of you are going to be challenged as to whether or not, wait a minute, where am I at? And I want you to know that right, from, right, right, right here from this moment, that if you're asking those questions and you're answering those questions in your life according to the scripture, it is absolutely a good thing. Why? Because Jesus said, we just saw this in the book of Revelation, that he rebukes those in whom he loves. I'm not coming to you this morning with the intent of a rebuking message. I'm not saying that. But I am telling you that that's what you and I just read. And when, when our world collides with what he said, who wins out? If you're honest, if you're honest, you would answer that most of the time that you went out. And that's the part that John is speaking to the church, these churches that the Apostle Paul had planted that are several decades old, is that he wanted them to collide with the living God and learn how to yield to God over self. That they, the, that they wouldn't be like the church in Laodicea here, as you and I have learned, they had all the external things put in place and they did not have a temperature or a heart for God. They knew of spiritual things, but they weren't responding to the Lord. Now, as, as a pastor, I can push a lot of, uh, you know, I can, I can press a lot of buttons there, if you will. But I'll draw your attention back to what we learned last week and we'll just use that one because that was the context of where we came through last week. And this applies for you folks that are visiting here this morning as well. Do we understand? Do we realize? Have, have, have we grown enough in our Christianity to, to recognize that when our pastors talk to us in the scriptures about money, have we come to that place to recognize and to realize that it's because that is the major God that all of us wrestle with and in the church God wants all of your heart and one of the powerful ways that you can see where people is at and you'll lose I mean like like this room right here is filled with you guys okay I could I could virtually lose 70% of this room by by making these statements but I hope you take it in the light that it's intended I'm bringing you an application. I'm talking you through something that you would test these things if they're true. Because if you have such a hard time honoring the Lord with your finances, 
Now, I'm assuming you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, I am not talking to you at all. This message is not even for you. I'm glad you're here. I, I, I hope that by the time we come to the end, maybe you respond to the Lord, maybe you don't, I don't know. But I'm not, I'm not talking to you as, as non-Christians. I'm talking to you as Christians. If you're a Christian, then you need to look at who the God is in, within your life. Is it you, like we saw all over here in Laodicea, the church at the, at the, that is re- reflective, it's representative of the church of the end time. Their money, their health, their clothing, their things that they enjoy. That, that's, that's, that was it. It was the serving of self. And what God calls us to is not that. Flip with me back to the book of Romans here for just a moment. Let's take a little different uh, vantage point at this. Uh, my aim is not to talk to you about money. My aim is to point to your heart, your heart. Each one of us have our own nasty hearts. I'm just pointing at your heart right now. In Romans chapter 10, are you still there? Are you, uh, are you still with me following along? Okay, Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, uh, I'm reading to you from New King James on this. Uh, I'll pick up, I'll give it a second. Uh, but I'm going to pick up in verse number six. Uh, just remember what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's, he's, uh, he's laying down those lanes of doctrine for the, for the Christians, for the church. And, and in verse number six, Romans 10 and six, he says this. He says, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way, comma, quote, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is, to bring Christ down from above. Can you understand that we're just speaking about the incarnation of Christ, his humanity? Jesus stepped out of heaven and came down to earth. Move to the next verse. Or, who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. Hmm. Only God has the ability to lay his life down and to take it up again. So we got the incarnation, the humanity of Christ, and we got the resurrection of Christ, you know, showing his deity. And what does it all point to? Verse number eight, take a look. He says, but what does it say? He says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. It's the gospel message of what Jesus offers you personally. He stepped out of heaven to come down. He showed the way that he lived in his deity He proved once and again that he was God. And the grace that he offers to us is powerful. It's life-changing, but it is just that. It is life-changing. And if your life hasn't changed because you've you've bought into easy believism, in other words, you've been attached in your past or in the present to not testing the spirits, what John says to do, and somebody has led you down a road that doesn't require a change of direction and an acknowledge of Christ within your life, then you're living in a fake Christianity. And the message that, that John has, that Paul has, that Jesus spoke in, 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 even in the book of Revelation is, is it's all about authenticity. Well, how do you get this good news? Well, look on verse number nine. Oh boy, this is, hey, this is where the room even gets more confused. He says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. That was, that was, that was a sarcastic amen by me, but I'm glad that you're in it there. Yeah, and this is where we get lost, isn't it? This is where easy believism, it always sets in. I remember how Jesus spoke to the masses and what he told his boys. He says, to those that unbelieve, I speak to them in parables because hearing, they will hear and not understand. He says, but to you, I've given the words of life that you might understand. Many people have come, they come across this and they, they don't even realize. We read, right? I mean, who's a Greek scholar in here? Uh, uh, not me. And uh, most likely uh, none of you. Okay, cool. But what we understand and what we know from this is, is, is very plainly is, is that what Jesus is saying, he says, here's the good news. Here's the good news. That if we acknowledge the fact that we are sinners and I surrender my life, if you could receive it that way, or you could even use the technical word here would be to pledge. You're pledging your life that, that Jesus would be the God of your life, the Lord of your life, that's what you're doing, the rule of your life. 
This is what he's talking about here. He's not talking about easy, easy believism. Is that you, oh, yeah, that's what I believe. I'm assenting to a, a collection of intellectual facts, and then you go on doing what you want. No repentance, no change, no follow, no nothing. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, is that if you understand the work of grace that God has given, his incarnation, Christ in his humanity, God, man, stepping down, he proved who he was by the miracles he did. He put a capstone on it and showing that he triumphed over sin and death, the resurrection, the deity of Christ showing that. If you understand the gospel message that he's given with his life that is to you personally, then you understand the good news. And the good news is, is that you can be forgiven of your sins and what you do is you confess. You pledge the lordship of Jesus over your life. It's not a fancy prayer. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 the, it's the attitude of the heart, the mind. It's your understanding. It's metanoia. I think it's the Greek word, there's a changing of the mind. Paul tells us in two chapters later here from Romans 10, in Romans 12, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. In other words, he's saying, let the light of God's word speak the truth within to your life so that you're not deceived. John says, test it. Stop believing all the nonsense that is out there and test it to see if it stacks up with scripture. And now in this room, I guarantee you, well, that's wrong. I won't guarantee you. I'm not God. Okay. But, but in this room, more than likely that God's word is colliding with some of you that, that, that maybe you just have a cultural Christianity because there's never been repentance in your life. There's never been a surrendering to the leading of God within your life. And in fact, this present moment, I know I just used the example of, of money, okay? That's not sending you to hell, but it is an example of how people resist the Holy Spirit. My way is better than God's. His word says this, but I'm gonna do that. But you know what that's like. So don't sit there and look at me with an ugly look and say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. I'm a good little sinner. You are a good sinner. You're <laughs> putting on that happy plastic face like all is good. Yep, they talked about that. God's word collides with who we are as individuals. And because his word collides with us, it brings us to that place of a decision point. His word is alive and sharper. It pierces right to that division. It's separating the temporal from the eternal. What God's word does is he gives us, a, uh, I mean, he, he gives us this so we can follow him, but he's speaking to us through the epistles in Christian living so that we can test. What do I really have? This is, not, this, is, this is not generating a works-based Christianity. What it is, it's a personal examination to see if Christ is really my Lord and Savior. Or, or is this just something less than that? It's all over the scripture. Test it for yourself. Don't believe me. Test it for yourself. Because at the end of the day, you're responsible for that. But if, if these things are true that I'm sharing with you, what are you going to do with them? I think, I think we should understand that God wants good to come out. I think they, that, that what, what John started off with in 1 John chapter 1 is that he's, he's, he was sharing these things so that we would avoid the lie to others, the lie to self, the lie to God, that we'd be in fellowship with God, that we'd be in fellowship with others. But we have to, we, we, we have to walk in the light of his word. When I walk in the light of his word, I have fellowship with him and his word cleanses me from all sin. When I'm under that deception and I move in a different path, a different way, and I, well, this is what I believe, and I'm not doing that, and I know it says this, but I'm over here and all these things. That's not a genuine submission to Christ. There's no change of direction. There's just the entitlement, the empowering of you. And when things are well within your life, it's like, who needs Jesus? which is often why God uses the difficult things within our life from the framework of sickness and money problems. And I got a new job again, and I got divorced, and I got relationship problems, and I got kids problems. God is using and allowing the, the terrible works of Satan. He takes that and he turns it for good because it's those situations that capture our attention, that we lift our voice to him in humility, humbling ourselves, in prayer, God help me, all of these things. We're changed from that. I respond to the living God. And many people, they sit in churches today with weak little messages coming out of the pulpit 
And people assent to the historical facts of Jesus, but they never surrender to the rule of Jesus within their life. And our pastors are stinking guilty of not bringing the good news. The good news is what Christ has done for us to save us from hell, and the way to walk is this. But when we don't hear that and, we, we, and we're not taught the word of God, and, and, you know, there, there's a lot of churches that are teaching the word. I'm not saying that uh, I, I'm the only one that teaches the Bible. No, but I am telling you, I am suggesting to you, I am saying test it yourself that we've got a number of places in this community that they'll throw a movie on the screen and they exegete a movie. Well, what did that make you feel like? And how did you like that? Like, it's happening right here within our community. And they're calling it churches. It's not a church. The church of God gets into the word of God for the purposes of God that we might have fellowship with him, that our joy might be full, and that we might understand that our God, the same way that we sing, he's the God of miracles and victories. Amen. I need that in my life, man. Amen. Yeah, amen. I say amen. And if I'm too radical here for you, I don't mean to be too radical for you, but I do absolutely 1,000% mean to communicate in a time where, where the church has become disillusioned and confused, I do mean to say this, that God's word is certain. It is clear. It, it, we can trust it to see where we're at. We can trust it to see where we're going. We can trust his word for these things. And we can, re, we can rely upon the fact that he's not a mean God that's looking to take us out. He's, he's a loving God that's looking for us to draw close to him. Because, I mean, Jesus told us, he says, he says it's your father's desire to give you the, the, the keys to the kingdom of God. It's your, it's your father's desire to give you the kingdom. God is a good God. It doesn't mean easy living. It doesn't mean that you're going to have all your, all your wants that you want right now. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that, that when a man's ways please the Lord, that he brings even his enemies at peace with him. And it does mean this, that when, then, that when a man's ways please the Lord and we call upon God, we humble ourselves before God, we ask God for help, that God shows up and he helps us. It does mean that we draw our attention, our direction, our affections from what God says. And Jesus told us in Matthew chapter seven, he says, he says keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. In other words, prayer. He says, don't give up in prayer. Don't give up. God may not have answered your prayer right now. That's only because of his delay in answering your prayers because he's trying to teach you and me, us, He's trying to teach us submission. And when I suffer, he's just trying to teach me to trust. Most of you know, we just came through this bout this past six months of, of, of my wife having cancer and that softball size you know, tumor that was in her abdomen and all this stuff and everything that we've had to go through and all that. And you know what? In the middle of not knowing what's gonna happen, is she gonna live, is she gonna die? I'm much too young to, I'm, I'm only 52 years old. I don't want my wife to die. My kids don't want my wife to die. But the reality of it is, is when suffering comes up upon us, I'm either going to get mad at God because he's allowed this, or I'm going to draw close to God. And whatever's on the inside of me, whether it's a genuine faith or a fake faith, that's what's going to come out. That's why you often see people, you know, who go to church, they claim I'm in church, they claim they're saved. When they hit a bad time, they hit the bottle. When they hit a bad time, they're hanging out at the nightclub. When they hit a bad time, they're smoking weed again. And they can never get out of these cycles. And it seems like they're always in a place of repentance and all of these things. Listen. Addiction is real, but our God is the one that does miracles and brings the victories. And when I'm, when I'm looking and relying and walking with him, he's the one that puts the enemy back on his heels and gives me the spoils of victory. Amen. God delivers me. It's not an ugly message from him. But Jesus also said this. Right? You, uh, many of you know this. He says, I didn't come for those who are well, but I came for those, watch, who know they are sick. Do you know that you're separated from God because of your sin? Do you know that? And if you know that, will you respond to him? John wants us to have the accurate information. Paul wants us to understand the way so that indeed that we could respond to him personally, not to intellectually assent to a collection of facts All right, we gotta finish the message. We're, uh, we're right here at time. Um, let me give you the second idea and just um, let me collapse it into a few thoughts. The second idea in verses three to six in our text is the test is easy. Here's what he says. He 
He says, but, uh, first, first John 4 and 3, he says, but if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is, is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you, you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to, to this world, and so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. The test is easy. Two important aspects here, maybe you, maybe you, Maybe you just glossed over, you didn't quite see it. But two important aspects here about the spirit of Antichrist. What does he do? He attacks truth. He attacks truth. And how does Satan do that? Well, number one, he, he, the, the enemy, he loves to diminish the work of the cross. And some of you have, have been around long enough, and, and some of you even believe that heretical teaching out there that Jesus had to suffer in hell after he got off the cross. That could not be more heretical. It could be more, uh, there's nothing that could be more fake than that. Because what did Jesus say from the very cross? He said it was to tell us that it is finished. He said it was finished there. And yet you get these fancy guys, they, you know, they got these nice leather Bible bound things and they don't even look, it looks like a brand new Bible. It looks like a dude never opened it before telling us, and Jesus had to go to hell and suffer. Now give me all your money and get out of here, you know? Nope. The Bible declares plainly that out of the words of Jesus, out of his very own mouth, it was finished. He did not have to go to hell and suffer. Or maybe you think that God can't relate to you and your situation. Did you catch, did you see how subtle that was? We went from a radical, heretical thing to a personal thing. But the, the enemy of your soul who roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The spirit of the Antichrist, what John is talking about right here. He desires to diminish the work of the cross in your life. And when you think that, 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 your situation is outside of the control of God, the care of God, the love of God. It diminishes the work of the cross. Jesus died for you. And what else? Why Satan wants to diminish the work of the cross, he also wants us to be distant from the work of the cross. He loves to push us into this place. Watch here, don't miss it. Don't miss this. Because this is, this, is, this, is over, this is over us in this room. Satan wants us to fall for the lie that God is angry with us. Satan wants us to fall for the lie that God is disappointed with us. Those are lies. How do we know that? Because the word declares to us that in Christ, the book of Colossians, that in Christ we are faultless. Paul tells us that we're new creations in Christ. God is not angry at you. God is not disappointed with you. What God wants is your heart. What God wants is your mind. What God wants is your life. What God wants is, is to be the Lord of your life, to rule your life, to direct your life. He doesn't want you sitting on the fence like those folks from the church of Laodicea, which represents the church in the last times. Well, you're hanging out on that fence. I'm, I feel like going to church, but I don't want to go all in. I'm going to do my good deed. I'm going to show up so pastor sees that I'm there. You know, I, you know, I don't want to hear him preach a message at me. You know, you know all these things. Listen, God's word is alive, and he's, and, and he's speaking to the church right now. Jesus Christ is coming back, newsflash. He's coming back, and he doesn't want people to be deceived. And well-meaning people fill up the chairs in this church, that, but they're completely deceived of what it looks like to be a Christian. John, Paul, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, he wants us to test things so that we would know the truth. Why? Because it's the truth that does what to us? It sets us free. It sets us free. It's the truth of God's word that sets us free. Can you handle the truth? I think that came out of like a movie. I'm not trying to go to a movie. <laughs> you can't handle it. <laughs> it's an old movie for, you know, all right, uh, moving on. Sorry. Couldn't resist that one. That was just right there. All right, let's close this. John says this. He says that the way a believer can, can know that God lives in him 
is by the operation of God's Spirit in their life. And what is that operation? It's God's Spirit that brings a genuine faith. And that genuine faith is marked by listening to God. And what's the bottom line? Jesus said it here, John chapter 3, verse number 7. Take a look at the screen. This is the bottom line of the whole thing. Jesus said, he says, don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. You cannot receive or obey the things of God unless you have been born again, unless you've acknowledged your position as a sinner, unless you confess that sin to God and you ask for God to be the Lord of your life. He's Savior and Lord. It's all like one package. I hope you understand that, okay? If, if you're getting caught up in the, in the, uh, the pneumatics, uh, 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 um, uh, the phraseology, maybe, then please go back to what I just taught you about what, what comes out of Romans and what Paul said about confessing with your mouth and all that. It's all tied together. You test it to see if that's true. Go home, open up something, and search it out. But if it is true, you're acknowledging your condition. If it is true that you're looking to God to be the Lord of your life, to be your Lord and your Savior, to, to, to take away and wash you of your sins. Watch, and uh, why do we say uh, uh, Lord and Savior? Well, Savior first because he takes away my sin. Lord next because he called us to follow. Do you understand that those are in the scriptures? It's not just some man-made thing that we're throwing these phrases together. Well, that's what you say as a pastor, Lord and Savior. It doesn't say that in the Bible. Well, you stopped reading your Bible long ago if you, if you can't consent to that basic, simple fact. He saves us from our sins, and he says, follow me. He's the Lord of our life. We follow him. And many of you, many of you have stopped at that place. In other words, you haven't fully repented the changing of the mind which leads to a changing of the heart, which leads to a changing of the feet. Many of you are caught in that middle spot, your indifference to the reality of the truth. And this morning, it is the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the person of God is Jesus. Remember what he said to the church in Laodicea, I stand at the door and knock. If you will open that door to me, then what's, what is he gonna do? He's gonna come in and make himself at home. Is Christ at home in your heart? Or are you still running from him? Are, 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 you, are you a person that comes to church, but you're, you're not really all in, and you know you're not in right now because you feel convicted? Conviction is good if it leads you to the right conclusion. But if you don't respond to conviction, then what happens is, is that you're overwhelmed by condemnation. In other words, if you don't respond to the light of God's word, what happens is the enemy of your soul comes in, Matthew chapter 13, and steals the truth, condemns you, and now you got to do something with that condemnation. You, you don't have a way to get rid of it. And so you turn back to, that's why I don't go to church. And you go out and you do what you want to do. That's the fight that goes on. That's the wrestling that's happening in this room. Not just in this room. It's, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's happening all over the globe, if you will. But, but this, is, this is God's word unfolded. And we're given these truths so that we, so that we come to that place and say, God, I, I, I don't got it all figured out but I want to respond to you. I don't have it all down. But I know that you grade me on the cross or at the cross and not in my performance. And I want to surrender to you. I want to follow you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I don't know, is that, is that the call of your heart today? Would you close your Bibles and stand with me, please?